we are we are recording now yes. and we're open to attendees and you're open so i'm going to wait to see if any attendees show up before i'll formally start on, on attendees i wondered if it would be possible to um have attendees be able or public comment be made at the beginning instead of we don't have a public hearing or anything before we get into the meat of discussion and then we could always have the you know public comment again after we've talked about I topics. was planning on doing it sometime during the bylaw discussion, middle and not waiting till outreach and all. Um, we'll see who shows up and try and catch it when we've got the most people. Okay, Pam, that might be early. We'll see. But yes, um, we might do two or something, but I was planning on certainly doing it earlier and maybe mid discussion. I mean, maybe people aren't talking necessarily about rental bylaws, so they might want to just yeah, bring their stuff up earlier and not have to sit through it. Okay, I'm going to get started right now. Um, we are still missing Shalini, but maybe by the time I'm done my speech. So I'm um, seeing a presence of a quorum. I am calling this August 22nd, no, August 25th, 2022, regular meeting of the CRC to order. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 21 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 22 and by chapter 20, chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, with that, I'm going to roll call to make sure that recording in progress everyone, everyone here, here and me heard. Heard. Um, rob shalini i muted you when you came in hi shalini i muted you when you came in it sounds like there's an echo on your line, line. okay how's that um i think that sounds good yeah okay so attendance shalini i'm here pat Present. Mandy's present. Um, Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. And everyone present. Um, we will move right into our agenda, um, which is no public hearings. Um, we have action items. We just have one. Most of the meeting will be residential rental bylaw, the review of the language and further discussion. Um, and then around six o'clock is when I hope to potentially run and turn to outreach. So that's sort of my thoughts. Um, maybe a little later, depending on when we do public comment and all. Um, we do not have minutes today. That is my fault. Um, so we will make sure we do them next time. Um, and so, yeah, so hopefully most of this meeting is on the bylaw language. Um, so I will explain stuff first as to what we're looking at today, what I hope to get through potentially. Um, and then um, we see attendees still coming in. We'll probably do a little bit of the conversation and then we'll go to public comment and then we'll continue our conversation. I just wanna make sure that for people running late, they don't miss public comment. Um, so this most recent draft and a new one went into the packet today um, includes changed language for some of the bigger sections, the um, how to issue or deny a permit um, what inspections and other requirements are needed in order to uh, meet the the requirements for a permit, um, and the penalties and incentives and, um, you know, violations, what a violation is, how to enforce, what the penalties are, that section. Those are all in blue. There is a section in orange, um, which is sort of permit display use and consent. Um, that has been pulled from before. We haven't really talked about that. If we have time today, I would like to briefly talk about it because it is a section that truly needs um, legal review because of the state laws, how much tenant um, and rentals, tenancies and rentals are regulated at the state level. And so I'd like us to talk a little bit about that so that we can send this working draft off to legal to get some legal opinions on what we might be thinking or considering including in a bylaw to make sure they are legal or not. 
Um, it would be better to know that sooner rather than later, I feel. So I'd like us to, if we can get to, even though we haven't discussed language, get to some of that there um, so that we have something to send off to legal or questions for legal. And then um, the new things that went in today um, are things that Pam has added. Um, at my request, um, she has been working a little bit on the regulations and potential draft regulations. They're not in any format right now. We've been adding stuff in. Um, I don't think we'll get to discussing some of that today, but it is definitely relevant to the penalties and violations section. Um, and when I was at the Board of License Commissioners meeting, they expressed some very nice willingness to receive draft regulations. Um, so that they didn't have to start from scratch. And so if we can get that done too, um, some sort of draft about what regulations might include if they are the ones that are going to be adopting regulations, they would be appreciative of receiving our thoughts on that and having that start. So I had asked Pam to sort of take the lead on what those regulations might look like, um, any potential changes to that as we discuss them. I don't know whether we'll have time today in an hour and a half to get through all of that. Um, but um, that that was many of the things that she added um, to that was stuff with that. And I know some of it is, a, and some of her comments on that are as it relates to the bylaw, because the bylaw language goes directly hand in hand with any regulations we um, propose in some sense, um, some of which might be more appropriate in the bylaw itself. Um, so I wanna thank Pam for taking some of the lead on that and putting some of those comments in. Um, with that, before we go to public comment, and this may be just one of a couple times we hear the public in, um, are there any questions about what's been going on or what we're going to try and accomplish today? Seeing none, um, we are going to go to public comment, and this is going to be the general public comment period, but it's also the just General public comment is public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. This can be anything related to rental registration or anything else related to CRC. It doesn't have to be non-rental registration related either. Um, so it's open for everything. Um, and anyone who would like to make a comment can express their views for up to three minutes um, at this time. And as I said, as we go through this discussion in the next hour and a half, I'm going to try to potentially every half hour or about when we switch sections of the bylaw to try and take more public comments so that, that people can be a little more um, involved and we can hear people who have attended in that, in that situation. Um, but if you don't wanna hang around the whole time or if you wanna say something right now, uh, please raise your hand and we will recognize you in turn. So at this time, I see no hands going up. And as I said, we will try in another 45 minutes or so, half hour, depending on how long it takes us to get through some of the sections, to do this again to see if anyone has anything else they'd like to say. Um, with that, we're going to move on to the language discussion and all. And um, I would like us to focus a little bit on the language um, today, uh, anything that might be missing or not missing. Um, from sections, and I know there's a lot of blue. Blue is stuff changed from the last draft you saw. We're trying to keep track of that just so people can see. We're not going to hit every section of blue. We're going to hit the big ones that are mostly blue. Um, but we're going to skip the penalties for a violation of the rent, the, the penalty block, that very first block that is totally blue right now. Um, $300 is the max we can put in here. Um, and so if people want that different than 300, than the max, we can certainly think, talk about that later, but that's why 300 is in there. We cannot go any higher. When we get down to penalties, we'll deal with what that means. Um, but Pam. So I'm just thinking that penalty doesn't necessarily have to be a fine. I, that sounds like a fine. A penalty could also be um, a loss of license loss of loss of permit so you shouldn't forget that yeah and and so this block does say c-section whatever for the non-monetary penalties um 
so so that's why it's sort of in there and that that reminds me i do need to share this so everyone knows what we're looking at um in, in as big a print as you can make it working on it <laughs> hold on that did not do anything i know that <laughs> so i'm gonna not show the comments because the comments are sort of just reminders of we need a legal for xyz type thing um and that should be allowed us to see things a little bit bigger um, I do sometimes lose hands in this view. I will try to keep them, but if someone sees a hand raised that I have not acknowledged, just tell me. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to go down to is the issuance or denial section. This is one of the newer sections. Um, I don't know if it was even in the last draft we saw in a packet because um, I just don't remember. Um, but this is basically the section that says, here's what you have to complete or meet in order to be issued a permit. Um, and here's how a permit can be denied um, as I page down. The renewals language was already in some of these. I just moved it into this section. Um, I think it was somewhere else in the bylaw, which is why it's black, not blue. Um, and then there's a couple of other things about how long the, the period is valid for and, and other things like that that we can discuss. So any particular, um, we're opening it up to discussion on this section on issuing or denying a permit. Um, Pam. Thanks. Um, I'd like to look at E1 um, and really just get a, a quick conversation about um, do we really, what, what do we want here? So it says a separate residential rental permit shall be issued for each individual building, noting the number of dwelling units included in each permit. So I just wanna clarify for myself, that means that if it's a Brandywine building with, I don't know, 24 units in a building, there is still just one building permit. And then, uh, so that's a question that would be, um, and then separately, if, if there's a property with, you know, three little um, interconnected units that would still be one building permit. Um, one individual house would also be one individual permit. Is that how I'm reading this? So that is how it was written um, right now, um, which is different from how we do it now, which is per parcel. So a Puffton right now gets one permit, but under this language, they would get, oh, I don't know how many buildings they have. Um, they would be required to have uh, 10, 12, 14 permits. I'm not sure how many buildings they have at Puffton, but Brandywine that I think only has two or three buildings would only need two or three permits. This does not dictate what the fee might be for the permit. Um, if we want the fee to be per building or um, per fee per unit or go up the men depending on the number of units in a building. But it would be, it would mean that on an application, all the units in one building are one application. Um, whereas if you do a permit per unit, I believe that would mean someone like Puffton would have to file 40, you know, 100 and some applications. And so I think we want to think about what the applications are versus the fees. But Rob can talk more, I think, about that, and then we'll go back to Pam. Rob? No. Uh, actually, I have a question. What What is the last sentence of that number one intended to cover? If, you know, based on what you just described, if Puffton that has, you know, one single address for the property and, you know, buildings A through Z, would that not be one single permit? So that that might be one single permit then um, an ADU, you know, there are some duplexes that have two addresses, I think. Um, yeah, there's a but, mix of properties that are, you know, assigned addresses by building addresses by units for, um, you know, in more recent years. And what we're doing now is establishing a, a, a number address for the property and then mm -hmm identifying buildings by usually letter and then unit numbers. It's kind of a sequence. So that language is just held over from where a, a boulder, I think, did it per building. Um, and so I'd love to hear if you think it would be best to get rid of that language or Rob, where, whether you think it still should be parcel, building, or unit, if any of those are there. 
Well, I'm not aware of any reason or, or you know downside to what we've done so far. I haven't heard of any problems. Um, you know, it does require multiple copies of the certificate to be printed and displayed in various buildings, uh, and certainly is a lot less paperwork for the applicant and for us to keep it by parcel uh, when it's under the same ownership. Pam or Jennifer, do you have questions before I ask my question? Or anyone else, but I know you guys' hands were up. I would want to ask that question of Rob, you know, whether it yeah, made sense to do it this way, but you answered it, thank you. And since it doesn't affect the fee, that's a totally different. Oh. Pam? We don't know if it affects the fee yet. So it, right. um, it, it actually does seem a little contradictory to have the first sentence and the last sentence. And that's why I brought up this question is we really need to think about the ramifications. Um, clearly, it feels like there ought to be probably a few more permits issued for large properties. Um, we've talked about you know, trying to separate from fee, but we've talked about um, possibly fee per unit um, as opposed to fee per property or fee per building. And, and again, it really needs to be looked at carefully with you know, a whole slew of examples that we could do to kind of compare the approach and understand how, how that affects both the workload for the town and um, um, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, so I have two questions and they both go to, in my thinking, I think I prefer per building at this point, but that's why I have these questions. The first one is about suspensions um, and failure to issue a permit, but mainly suspensions. If we were going to start actually suspending permits, if there's one permit per parcel, if that permit say at Puffton is suspended um, or Brandywine, that means every unit on that parcel can't be rented, um, I think, as the way we've got it written. So that's one way I was thinking about maybe more permits are more useful because maybe we could use suspensions more because I have a feeling, Rob and John, correct me if I'm wrong, you would be really hesitant to suspend or non-renew a permit for an entire apartment complex versus a building of four units in the apartment complex. So that's question number one. And I guess question number two goes directly to inspections. Um, if inspections are per permit, that means if we're issuing a permit for every building, more units will need to be inspected in those larger complexes every time an inspection is due um, because it's, we, we haven't set those regulations and all yet, but I know we were thinking some sort of percentage, but if you had up to 25 units in a building, all of them get inspected. And so, if each permit only covers a building of up to 25 units in most of the places, every unit would need inspected at a Puffton potentially versus a percentage of units. And so that, that issuance of decision of permit per building, permit per unit, permit per parcel has direct effect on those two items. And I don't know which our town would prefer on those two items. John? Yeah, I, I get your point about, um, you know, uh, denying someone's permit or, or revoking somebody's permit, but the properties that you're talking about, you know, boulders or Puffton, those aren't, um, you know, um, we're not there that, that often. Um, they're, they're not actually in the spotlight as far as um, problem properties. So it seems like a lot of um, paper handling for um, not not much outcome. Rob? So to add to that, um, you know, if, if a larger property that has multiple buildings, if we're looking at suspension for code reasons, life safety, sanitary conditions, we don't need that you know, that ability in this bylaw to be able to do that and just kind of separate those those problem issues uh, from the rest of the complex. If we're looking at it to be more of, um, you know, the other types of potential violations that could lead to suspension, 
that are not related to, to building and safety codes, then it seems like we could address that in the penalties section in another way and not necessarily have to have it rely on the permit issuance. And, and I um, would say the same thing for inspections. I think just because we issue a permit per building or per property, our inspections could address when there are multiple buildings, multiple units under the same ownership on the same property and allow for those different inspection schedules. Thanks, Rob. Shalini. So if we um, charge fees based on the units, then can we do that if you're not really um, doing the inspection? Like, shouldn't the service be commensurate with the fees? Does that make sense? Like, is that question, is that clear? Yeah. So I think that's where how many units get inspected per complex or building unit size. So if there's five units, all of them get inspected, that requires more work than one unit, a single family home getting inspected, right? And a, a parcel like Brandywine or Puffton or Boulders that has a lot of units, if it's not everyone, you know, a lot of the towns and cities that do this do a percentage over a certain number. Like if there's more than 25 units, they start doing a percentage, but no less than 25, such that at least 25 are being inspected in all of these. And that requires a different level of commitment from one. And once you've done that, um, you, you can in some sense justify the differential in fees because there is different work in order to issue that permit. Um, is that, is that your thinking, Rob? Rob? Yeah, and in addition to that, you know, those larger apartment buildings where we might be doing fewer inspections than the number of units have common areas and that takes time. So the hallways, the laundry rooms, um, any of the areas that the tenants would be accessing to get or, or going through to get to their units would be part of that inspection. So that, you know, helps justify or that takes additional time than uh, maybe a single family or duplex would. John? Yeah, I was going to um, point that out, too. I mean, we're, we're doing those common areas every two years anyway. So, you know, if I'm at the boulders doing all of the common areas, I'm walking through all of the hallways, I'm going in all of the laundry rooms, you know, to do um, an additional 10 apartments or something like that. I'm, I'm already there. Um, so, you know, I'm there for three hours or I'm there for four hours. It's it. Um, it would make sense to tie it to that sort of a schedule, the times when we're there. Thank you. So am I hearing from our committee, I've, I've heard from Rob and John that per parcel um, is preferable due to paperwork and other issues um, and not a need for having it per building or per unit here to get to other issues that it can be dealt with somewhere else. But from the committee, I just wanna make a note if we wanna change this language, if it's not per building. Um, so can I just have a informal raise of, or, or just, I'll just go through committee members so they can give their preference on which is preferred building parcel um, or unit for the permit. Um, Shalini? Um. So I'm hearing a no for the buildings and more and a yes for the parcel, like the logic for that. Can we highlight what is the, and especially if the fees and all of that is separate. Um, so can I hear what is the logic for then doing it for a building? Like what are the pros for? So my original logic was on the penalty side. It allows you to suspend a much smaller portion of the set of units on any one parcel if you do it per building. Um, but Rob and John, at least to me, have convinced me that we can rewrite the penalty section to give more leeway on suspension such that we might not need more permits on a parcel to do it that way. Jennifer? No, I would um, defer to Rob and John on this since it's not related to fees. So I'm just gonna make a note that we modify that to go per parcel. I think 
Is that agreeable to everyone? I haven't had my say yet. Oh, Pam, Pam, <laughs> I'll, I'll change my note if you don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it makes sense what we just heard uh, that that by parcel is is preferable just from a paperwork standpoint. I want to be really careful that that because we have it by parcel that we in fact don't then overly penalize or overly permit you know everybody else in town, which is lots of the smaller units. And that's that's why you know by building was starting to make sense. Jennifer? Yeah, um, no, I just want to be clear. I mean, if, if the per, if the fee, because again, what I think we're hearing from the property owners is that I mean, it's a separate discussion, but that someone who owns one house feels that they shouldn't pay the same permitting fee as someone that you know has a hundred units, but that's totally separate. We're not implying that here. Correct? <laughs> I yeah, and we haven't gotten to drafting the fee schedule yet, but part of the whole point of this in my mind has been to be able to get us to a fee schedule that makes it more commensurate to that. Pat? Just to continue each of us responding, I would like to go with John and Rob's suggestion of it being by parcel. Thank you, Pat. So I will try to rewrite the section <laughs> for parcel, and you saw the notes I typed into the comment section address those within the different sections as we get to them and changes to those sections too. Um, the rest of this, I did have one question myself on number eight, permits all July 1 and June 30. Um, that's what our current bylaw does. It makes it easy in that sense for renewals, everything at the same time. But if we're going to be putting inspections on, I've been struggling as to drafting a bylaw that's like yearly inspections, but when is it done if everything's up at once? Poor inspections and John would be doing everything in June <laughs> or May potentially. And we already have the problem of everyone moves out if we do the required inspections, if we require inspections at every change in tenancy, we're already putting all those inspections within a certain amount of time potentially. Um, and so is it worth considering in permits that are valid upon issuance and for a certain amount of time after issuance such that we might start staggering the permit time, you know, the permit renewal time period is not all at once. It becomes sort of yearly depending on when an owner um, has applied for a permit and then their permit's valid for a year from whatever date it's issued versus July 1 to June 30. Um, John. I guess my question is about um, with the inspections, why is it tied to a move out date? So we'll get to that section. One of the things we had in that section as we get to that was a, I think Pam, you can do this. We, we, we drafted something that said, upon change in tenancy, an inspection. But we can look at the language specifically if I tried to put in there, if it hadn't been inspected within the last six months or something um, in there. So I, I mean, I could see why, I could see, you know, we stay with the annual renewal of all the permits. That's an easy way to go. And then at some point during the year, you're going to get inspected. Yeah. And I think that's how I've tried to write this section up here. Um, where did I do it? Um, past inspections within the applicable time frame in accordance with section H and applicable regulations. And so that's how I sort of tried to do it there. Like if you meet the regs for when you were last inspected, you've met that requirement. Um, and so John, does that mean that you, uh, uh, Pam first and then I'll go back to John and Rob. Well, that, that's helpful because I was gonna ask, you know, what is, what is most, um, typical here in Amherst, I can't remember, I can't remember when, when leases start. I know Renata Shepard is in the audience, she could tell us, but what's the typical uh, start of, um, of rentals and, you know, what's the, the year cycle? 
um, what I heard from John Thompson now is, is helpful to understand that it could still work. It's, I mean, it's sort of awkward in the wording, but it could still work to have um, those inspections occur on a, on a rotating basis around the year because there's no way they're gonna get them all done with every change of tenancy in July. <laughs> John or Rob? Yeah, I just think it's more manageable um, if if you can, you know, put them on a different schedule. Um, it it breaks it up, and you can spread it over the year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Rob. Yeah, I don't even think there's an option with this. Um, I don't see how we would ever be able to perform that many inspections in that short period of time, no matter how large our staff was. So I think we're going to be looking at a staggered schedule for inspections. Um, you know, I, when I think about why we, we picked that date, there might've been a couple of reasons back uh, in 2013 or 14 when we decided on that, but for whatever it's worth, um, it's good now for us. Again, more of a department thing. We issue almost 5,000 licenses or permits a year. And uh, programs have different dates, you know, for health licenses, we start dealing with those in October. Alcohol renewal and restaurant licenses are at the end of the year by state law requirements. So, you know, it was, it, it's a convenient time of the year to deal with a bulk number of applications and uh, have staff that's able to focus on that. So for that reason alone, I, I think it's, um, it's good where it is. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Any other questions, concerns, or comments on the language in this issuance or denial section from anyone? I still would like to know what the typical um, rental uh, lease cycle is for most for most properties in town. Rob, do you know? Uh, I'll actually pass that off to John if he knows better than I do. John. <laughs> I think that um, I th I think it's um, it's around June first. I think that's when most um, leases turn over. So you know they graduate in May. There's been some consternation about UMass changing their graduation date because the the lease cycles are going to end. And so what are these kids supposed to do? Um, but I think that it's June to June, and then. Um, you know, most of them are empty all summer. They they pay rent for that, and then they they move in, and they're moving in now. I mean, this next week will be the big big push. Thank you, John Pat. Yeah, it. We're talking about rental uh, uh, lease cycles, so we're only you're only responding with the information or asking questions about information referring to students. Is a typical family that rents a dwelling in town, um, or is in is there at least the full seven one through six thirty? Is there? So when I rented, my lease was July one to June thirty. Um, but so it's for... but I was through Amherst College, um, and that's the employee start date for all new hires, <laughs> at least on the faculty side. So it made sense that that's when they did theirs. Um, you know, when we were looking, though, I think the lease terms were just a year from whenever you would have rented at someone something like Rolling Green when I was looking for rentals. Um, so this date does not necessarily follow a lease timing. Well, then maybe we maybe we need to clarify that we're talking about student rentals. I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems odd to me. Um, well, the permit is the permit, right? Yeah, and that's true. That's true. Yeah, never mind. Right. But it, it really uh, is interesting how we're really only talking about student rentals. That's all. Seeing no other hands for this section, we're going to move on to the next section. Um, and after the next section is when I'll go back to public comment. Um, so the next big one is this requirements for permit. We started talking a little bit about this section, I think, two meetings ago, the inspections. Um, after inspections are energy efficiency standards, occupancy limits, law and regulation compliance, parking site plan, 
and living off campus certification. Um, let's start with inspections and then we'll go through um, each of the other sections and, and see if there's any comments on them first. Inspections have multiple sections. So we'll start with the section that is inspections required. So H1A. Um, any comments? Is it too specific, not specific? Do people not like the, is there issues with anything in there? I expected Rob and John to have comments. Rob. Yeah, I was going to suggest that it could be less prescriptive on the timelines. Uh, we, we have so many different situations that call for 24 hour, 48 hour, seven day um, remedies in the various codes. And I think that could be left, um, you know, as you know, in accordance with the applicable regulation, some sort of language like that more general. And then, you know, I do have concerns about how we finally work out the whole life safety violation definition. And I just want to, I, I guess, just as a comment for moving forward is that we, we don't try to redefine or define what a violation or life safety violation is that would be in conflict with one of our other codes. So, um, you know, just as we look at that, and I think when I look back at this last week, you know, there was something in the, the definition that concerned me, but I'd have to go back and look for that. Uh, but those are my two general comments. So I think we deleted the definition of life safety violation, because um, I think Pam pointed out to me that there is sort of a defined term in state regs. Is there, Rob? Yeah, each each of them would define that probably differently, or you know, based on a, on different situations. So, um, yeah, that that's that's well uh, covered in other places. Uh, I think it was when we were trying to incorporate something like uh, over occupancy as a uh, life safety violation. Then then that starts to get a little different. John. Yeah, the sanitary code, which we rely on a lot, has a whole section. 750 violations are all life safety violations. And, um, you know, they they require um, immediate remediation. So um, they're pretty well defined. There's a whole, there's, there's probably uh, 10 of them in there. And then the final one is anything else that the inspector says is a life safety violation. So it's, you know, gets pretty broad at the end. So removing a specific definition from this bylaw is quite helpful for you all. Um, the question I guess would be, do we want to mention life safety violations at all in here or would you prefer us to delete that completely? So I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it could be, a, uh, you know, uh, based on violation and, you know, that it's handled as prescribed by the applicable code or regulation being enforced by the uh, the code enforcement officer. Okay, Pam. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought a little bit. But if we if we um, if we don't list health and safety or sanitary code, any of those building code violations specifically, um, I want to somehow be able to tie those to a point system where we're really talking urgent and, and dangerous living conditions, which need to be addressed. Uh, you know, the time, the time frame or the turnaround time, you could leave flexible because that is per handled by prescribed code. Um, but, I, but I do want to mention them because I do want to be able to assign a point to start building um, tally sheets for properties that are problems. I am trying to tie violations to owners and building property managers. The only way it's the only way we're going to get any kind of you know better adherence to you know. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I had a question in, you know, reading the survey forms on Engage Amherst that came back and, and the ones that were completed by tenants. So there was a lot of, you know, mention of mold 
or windows that don't close com completely. So it's cold in the winter of utilities or even stoves that work intermittently. And, and I'm just wondering those, if, if types of, is that a, is that actually a code violation? Like is mold something that would and would do? Were you finished, Jennifer? You know, I just lost you completely. I'm sorry. No. I, okay. My Continue, phone just Jennifer. Went so I, I thought I had lost you. No, but are those are, are those violations that is it seems that there's a lot of recurring concerns in those survey forms, and I'm wondering if those are violations that would be cited. John? Yeah, so um, mold is not called out specifically in the sanitary code, but um, excess moisture is is how we address it usually. Why why is there mold? Um, you know, if there's mold in the bathroom, is the bath fan actually working? Are the people turning the bath fan on? Um, uh, that way is if there's a stove that's not working or there's even a single burner on a four burner stove that's not working, yeah, that's, that's something that's addressed um, and it's addressed through the sanitary code. So uh, if your windows don't close, the windows are supposed to be operable. And, um, you know, if you can't close them and lock them, they're not operable. If they don't stay up, they're also not operable. Those are all things we look for when we're in a, when we're in a unit. Okay, thank you. And those could be, if it's a violation, it's not fixed. It could, if we do a point system, it could accrue. Those could. So the way we handle them is, um, you know, you, depending on how egregious it is, uh, we assign a, a, a time to remedy. So, you know, if it's a 750 violation, it needs to be done in 24 hours. If, if it's a window that doesn't stay up or doesn't close or doesn't lock, how about 15 days? I'll give you 15 right. days to fix that. 30 days for this other thing. Um, you don't have a handrail on the basement stairs. I need that fixed in seven days, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, and then we just track those and then we go back and do a, a reinspection. I just did one in a place today. You know, they've had 30 days to fix the things that needed to be fixed. And yeah, they were all set. They can get a certificate of a compliance now. Thank you. If they don't fix them, you know, we find them. Any other questions on this part? Pam. So I just needed to talk about John's last point. If we don't, if they don't fix them, we find them. Um, I would like to find them, but I would also like to assign some points so that um, their behavior over time is, you know, within X number of years is recognized as being poor landlords. Um, and I don't know. I like the idea. I, I didn't know they were fine, but that's that's helpful to know. So Thank it's a hundred dollars a day. Once you once you've assigned that remedy period. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we'll talk about the point system when we get down there. Um, in more detail, at least. Um, so we'll work on that. Frequency of inspections. Any thoughts and comments on this? So this is where three years is everything, um, although it can extend to five. Um, this initial inspection is an attempt to say, um, we're trying to say everyone needs to be inspected when this bylaw is adopted. But I think, um, I don't know whether this is possible for your department, right? <laughs> and so I, th this is the, how do we get everyone on, on an inspection schedule? I put one year in here, we could put that up to three years with you guys by regulation, figuring out who starts with their inspections type thing. Um, so that one I'd like to hear from. And then this is where we talked about change in tenancy. Um, four or fewer dwelling units, every dwelling unit would have to be inspected during change in tenancy. And then yearly inspection, um, 
if they had three or more violations within one permit year, they'd have to be inspected annually. Long-term tenancies um, could go up to five years and owner-occupied rentals, um, don't you don't inspect the owner's dwelling unit. Um, thoughts on this section, this portion of the section, the frequency section, Rob. I, I think when we, you know, get further along in figuring out how we would implement this bylaw, you know, in number two, I think that that one year would probably be increased to three years. Uh, but I, you know, I guess we can leave that for, you know, final decision based on how we think we can staff this. Um, personally, I don't think we're ever going to um, conduct inspections at change of tenancy. I think if we're on that three-year schedule, um, that's a huge step that we'll be taking. Uh, and then uh, when we move down to number four, yearly inspections, what I really would like to see, although I'm fine that that looks fine, um, I'd like you know, further ability to set a custom inspection schedule for those prop properties that have issues. Um, which is something that we do now, um, something that I um, was one of the things that I wanted to have added to our current bylaw, just having the ability under, you know, under properties that have repeat violations or, or multiple violations that, that we can customize that inspection. Um, you know, John can tell you plenty of examples that um, there are properties at times that we we had to go there monthly, we had to go there quarterly, uh, you know, and it and it takes that sometimes to really institute the change that we want to see at a property, and and demonstrate that the manager is is um, you know more engaged than they may have been before. So I really think that's an important piece for us uh, in this new regulation. Pam. Uh, would would in any case, Rob or John, the inspections occur more? Well, besides those actual pr problem ones, would it occur any any more frequently than one annually? Because I could see that there is a whole category, perhaps, of uh, rentals that that need to get reviewed annually. Are any of these customs that you're thinking of more frequent than that? Yeah. Um, I have properties that I inspect every, you know, like Rob said, quarterly. So can can we, I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to how do we link violations and repeated, you know, need for inspections. I want those people to be really aware that they are operating poorly and maybe their license gets suspended. So I really want to see those properties hammered. I'm, you know. One of the ways I've I've implemented this is is um, you know they've been self certifying. So if you just if you just certified that your property met all applicable codes um, on July first, and I go in there in August and I make three pages of notes, yep, uh, that you know pisses me off. Yeah, yeah. Then you're not actually. I don't think you're really looking at these. So we'll look at them. So, so you know, Pam, I understand that concern, and and we certainly have to deal with some of that. I wonder if once we get under a regular inspection schedule, um, even every three years or every one year, we'll find potentially that John doesn't need to have some property on a quarterly inspection schedule. I that could be pie in the sky for me, right? Um, I don't know, but I wonder if because we've been under self certification, that that's problematic. But if you're in there every year forcing an inspection with our inspectors and those issues need fixed, they might not show up so frequent. You have to be in there three or four months in a row, you know, every quarter just to make sure. Um, Rob and then Jennifer. So I just want to be clear, this is a very small number of properties um, that we currently deal with. And just in my experience and, you know, no, no way, um, you know, to the level that John's involved with these properties out in the field, looking at them. Um, it, it's 
it's shocking when you know you're back there a month later or two months later and finding no or little improvement and maybe even worse conditions. And you know the the point system, the the penalties, the the, the sus potential suspension are the things that we don't have now. And you know it's it, it's just more time consuming. So although I think what Mandy, what you said is is true, I think there's always going to be that small number of properties that's going to need that 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 extra level of attention. Thanks, Jennifer. It may be more when we get to points, but what about a landlord applies for a permit for a new building that they've acquired and it's a landlord that it has a number of problem properties? This can there be any way that comes in, that, that is taken into consideration? Or, and I guess what I'm also saying, and then maybe if this has to wait till points, but can um, you, you know, can a landlord accrue points, a property owner from different properties because you see a consistent pattern among that person's properties? So I think Pam's Carol. trying to write something like that into the language um, somewhere in the penalties or regulations. <laughs> um, uh, whether it's legal or not, I don't know. Um, again, why getting a legal opinion is so important. Um, to be able to combine things, but I know we've there's some draft language somewhere farther down in this bylaw or in the regulations. Um, but John or Rob, have you guys thought about that, or do you know whether that might be possible? Rob? Yeah, I noticed that in in the draft, and you know, I mean, other than it being pretty complicated to track and and monitor that. Um, I had the same question uh, on, on whether and what the legal opinion would be on that. So I think we'll, we'll definitely need to wait and hear more about that. Um, on one of you know Jennifer's uh, questions, um, oh, I just lost what it was, but I had an answer to it. Um, the other pro other properties owned by the same. Could I, I, her question was if you've already known there are that a specific property owner does not take care and always has problems on properties when they apply for a new permit for a completely new rental property. Oh, right. Yes. Um, thanks. Um, you know, I think a provision on change of ownership, you know, would be would be appropriate. I think um, it's something we typically do in our land use permits. Uh, there's not a, a large number of those every year, uh, but it certainly, it, it makes, it, it makes us connected with the new owner in a way and be able to understand their management plan for the property, which is, which is really an important piece. Uh, so I would, I would be in favor of that, you know, on, on change of, uh, change of ownership. I think we had that somewhere in issuance, but Pam? Is that just like a, an inspection at change of ownership? Because theoretically, there should be there should be an inspection um, with any change of ownership or you know or issuance of a new permit. Is that what you're talking about? Those is, is um, an inspection. Or are you talking about how do you link that to the to the poor track record person? Um, John. Um, I'm thinking that that probably most properties, if they change ownership and they're just coming online for a new permit, then you know they do need an inspection because yeah. uh, we've never walked through that house before. So we have a transfer of permit section here. Um, so if the permit's already there, not not a place that's never been a rental before, but if it's been a rental and someone else buys it and wants to keep it a rental, this is this is what would show up. Um, in the middle of the year, if it was mid-year, um, that they would be able to get it, assuming the use has not changed in the operation, it is subject to permit and management plan. So that's the, the zoning use permit. Um, notify within 15 days and submit proposed changes in the provisions of the permit. We could add an inspection requirement into this too, if people would want. John, do you have thoughts on that? 
since your hand is raised. Oh, sorry. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> not a bad idea. <laughs> so even if they're already a, a, a permitted place, it, if it changes hands, it still gets a, an additional inspection. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, back to inspections, we're going to go on to the exempt properties. Um, and they are subsidized housing. The dwelling units that are inspected do not need inspected by the town. Um, occasional rentals. Um, this is sort of like Airbnb, but even less. Um, well, no, this is like sabbatical years. Um, was in there. That's in there right now. And then those that were just issued a certificate of occupancy within the last three years, so newly built buildings. Thoughts on those three exemptions? From inspections. They're not exempt from obtaining a permit, they're exempt from being inspected. Pam? Can we clarify? Um... Uh, in in talking with Steve Walzak from uh, Puffton Village, it sounds like they get the HUD um, three year cycle. So they, they come in and and uh, inspect a certain percentage of all of the units there on a sort of on a three year cycle. Spot spot numbers, spot units are are inspected. Um, I guess that falls under the subsidized housing. Is that correct? I just want to make sure that we're not either adding something that doesn't require us to inspect. Are there any buildings out there that, that we really have no responsibility to inspect at all besides the campuses? Rob, do you know? I'm not thinking of any, um, and John, feel free to help me out. But um, I guess you know one comment I had on the subsidized housing was that maybe we don't uh, exclude it so you know and, and make it more that we we may not or may accept you know the annual report. Um, and you know I'm struggling with that one because John and I right now are in the middle of a situation where we are in complete disagreement with the mm. HUD inspector. Mm. I mean, it's not, even, it's, not even, it's not even close where we both fall on this. And it was, it was passed by the HUD inspector and we can't um, allow ourselves to allow the occupancy to happen. So, um, you know, I think, in, I think for, for most cases, that's not the issue and we would rely and be open to accepting those uh, those annual certifications or, or three-year certifications, but I think we need to retain the option to uh, to do our inspection and not have the bylaw, you know, exclude us from that possibility. Uh, Jennifer and then John. Okay, well, that's really helpful input. Thank you, Rob. I mean, that's it. examples we would never think of. Um, so I just wanted to ask in terms of like someone going on sabbatical. So I understand not having an inspection, they're going away for a semester or a year. But what if they stay longer? You know, what if that semester to a year rental turns into two or three years? At some point, should there be an inspection? Or would it be like if they renew a permit for a second year, then you might want to consider an inspection? So we've got this language here that says any renewal of such residential rental permit um, that was obtained without the need for an inspection shall comply with all, including an inspection. So it could be worded Thank you. better. That's there. Yeah, that's there. But Sorry. I think the intention is if you've done it for more than a year and you want to renew and do it again, now you need an inspection. Okay. Thank um, you. It might need better worded though. John? Yeah, I was going to go back to the HUD thing. Um, so that's a specific case that we have going right now, but I've actually been in um, this situation before in the, in this role where, you know, I'm, I'm in a unit for something. I, uh, there's something 
that's amiss. It's not code compliant and, you know, but it's just had a HUD inspection. Um, so I'm actually not sure what it is. I don't think they look for the same things that we look for. And um, I'm nervous about that. Would you rather us not exempt these at all? I guess I'm curious if we know how many there are. Do we, Rob? We can get that for sure. I don't know. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but we can get it. Okay. So we'll see if we can change the language that makes you more comfortable. Pam? And just to make sure the Amherst Housing Trust gets inspected by you folks already, right? The Housing Authority buildings. Housing Authority, right. John, no, Rob's nodding yes. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. We, we do our periodic inspection of those buildings now of the common areas, not, but not of the dwelling units. Oh, should we be? Or is that again, sort of a, some, some other state organization goes in and does inspections? And the reason I'm asking is while I was campaigning, I'm walking through some of the other units and the woman says, I can't get my screen fixed on my front door. You know, I have to reach into my front door to open the latch because it doesn't work properly. And these are all clearly things that if you were trying to, they're, they're, they're problems. Yeah, so that's a common type of a a call we would respond to. So we would have a health inspector go out and address that issue. Uh, but we are not, um, we are only, the building inspectors only looking at common areas, and major building systems, but nothing within the dwelling units, although, uh, which are, you know, being inspected by these, uh, these other inspectors. Uh, but we absolutely respond to those, uh, those concerns or complaints by the tenants when they occur. So I think, Pam, this subsidized housing section would exempt the specific units that were inspected from an inspection unless we change the language, including at the housing authority buildings. Because I believe the housing authority is a subsidized housing, but I'm not, I, I'm not positive on that. Pat? Yeah, I'm hearing Rob say that it, it's sort of complaint driven. They would go there if that person complained to them, but is there any, is, should there be something listed that, that that town will respond in those instances or in any instance? Um, because I, how would a tenant know that you were if, if they see, if it's the building's been inspected and everything's supposed to okay, be okay, but they have a landlord that's not complying with their need, their safety or health need. So what I'm hearing is maybe we don't want to exempt these from yeah. this inspection so that under this bylaw, our inspectors can get into the units, not just the common areas. I'd agree with that. Yeah. But making sure that it still, you know, it still works or that we give credit to inspections that, that have been made. The have been made would be the what Rob suggested, the may waive the inspection requirement, you know, our department may waive the inspection requirement, pending confidence in these inspections type of thing. Um, so, Jennifer. So to Rob and John, so uh, tenants in these buildings would call it Amherst Building and Safety. They don't consider themselves not. They do. You know, they call, they're very complaining. So we, we do get in quite a few units that way. Right. What I'm nervous about with, with, ex, with being in every single one of these is um, these, a lot of these are long-term tenants. They've, they've been, you know, in these units for a while and we're gonna, it's gonna generate so, some work for us because um, some of the ones that we get into, if there's a medical emergency or, you know, there's a kitchen fire or something, there's, there's often other, other sort of lifestyle issues that um, we then have to try to manage. So making them still taking them off the exempt list 
is not a bad thing. It gives you per perhaps the option to, Rob, get in there. Yeah, I, I think if Pam finished that, I, I would agree. The the I'm not suggesting that we should or go inspect all of these units, um, but I think if we uh, you know had three calls from tenants in one particular building a year, maybe we would consider not waiving it the you know the ne the next time the renewal was up, and you know we can coordinate inspections with their HUD inspector. We can do things different. You know, there's other there's options. You know, we can go along for a couple of the inspections and, and feel good about it. But, uh, you know, there might be times where we just want to have that option and not have, uh, you know, the housing authority or property owner say, no, you actually can't come in here because of what it says in this section. Okay, we'll work on new language for that. Moving on. Inspection standards, much of this has been moved to potential regulations. Um, we did include in here, if it contains more than 25 dwelling units, um, then everything is inspected, um, on that initial inspection. I'm not sure if my language here is right to sort of get that across, but, um, otherwise the percentage above 25 units in a, um, in a property um, would be determined by regulation. Can you please explain where the the twenty four and and you know anything over twenty five comes from? Other bylaws, other towns that have done this. <laughs> it really was just a random number picked. I I saw it as a common number in other bylaws. Um, so yeah, that's how I got that number. I'm happy to change it to anything people think is more logical. Okay, so I mean, it, what makes me think is that I know there's been discussion um, by the planning department that they're looking at, you know, what are our definitions of apartment buildings? And right now it's anything from three to 24 units. And yet we have mixed use buildings, which are literally apartment buildings, but they're allowed a whole lot more units. So I think that I, don't, I didn't know where, why 24 was a magic number. It, it works today as one, one apartment building, but tomorrow it might not work. Yeah, so it's a building, but I think the way this is written now for residential rental properties, that means Puffton, which has about eight units per building, you'd still only inspect whatever that percentage, a minimum of 25 of the entire property. 25%. Um, and then, and then depending on how the regulation is, um, it could be 25% of all units, minimum of 25. I think they've got more than hundred units. So, you know, um, could be 25% of all units. It wouldn't be per building. It would be per property the way this is written. Um, so you wouldn't be in a building that has, you know, with Puffton, you wouldn't have to inspect hundred percent of the units. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to leave it for now. I just needed to think about that a little bit more. Okay, we're going to move on to two. Two we discussed a couple weeks ago. Um, so we're not going to discuss that this time. Everyone seemed okay with the language on two energy efficiency standards. Um, three and four occupancy limits. Um, so these are, again, these are the requirements to part of obtaining a permit. You have to meet these requirements. And so energy efficiency is um standards adopted by regulation we just don't know what those regulations are going to be um occupancy limits is proof of compliance with the occupancy limits for the re residential rental property as specified in the zoning bylaw if they don't have that proof they cannot obtain a permit law and regulation compliance all rental units and rooming units regulated shall comply with all applicable local bylaws and regulations as well as all state laws and health building and fire codes um, I don't know whether that's comprehensive enough, Rob, um, from what you're looking for, um, to allow for violations um, of the bylaw. Uh, but if you don't comply, you don't get your permit. Um, don't we say that in a couple different places? <laughs> we do, basically. Um, 
we just want to make sure we're saying the same thing in a couple different places. And then parking site plan. This comes right out of our current bylaw. I'm not sure any of the language has changed. Um, although it might have changed to put one of, but but there is a parking site plan requirement in our current rental bylaw. Um, right. Yeah, and so I think all of that comes from there. And then there's this living up, oh, Shalini. Before we go to the living off campus certification, Shalini. Yeah, we've been hearing some concerns about um, the parking. I don't, okay, I guess the question that pertains to this is the waiver and uh, maybe can we clarify like what might be some criteria based on which the waiver would be given. And then I was hoping that we can use this opportunity to also maybe explain to uh, people that um, you know, the downtown there, it's the where they don't require to give parking. So it's not like they're getting a waiver or getting away with anything. I don't know if you need to explain that now, but I just hear those concerns all the time. So we could use this opportunity to explain the downtown parking is different from residential areas. Rob, can you explain how your department enforces this particular section in the current bylaw? Yes, so um, the, you know, the applicants required to submit a parking plan uh, with every application, each, you know, each application has that on file with it. Uh, in some cases, the parking plans are established by a land use permit uh, and, and just kind of continues on with this permit as well. Um, the zoning bylaw has a, a number of different design standards for parking. For example, um, parking space delineation. So the, the painted lines on the surface is a requirement of the bylaw. Um, lighting, screening, there's just a whole, whole number of different criteria. And the waiver is used in certain cases. It's used rarely, but in certain cases where maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't need to have, have to happen that way. So um, if a good sign can replace painted lines on a gravel parking lot in a six lot, six car parking area, we might consider that and waive the delineation requirement. Um, you know, the location of the parking on the site in relation to the neighbors, maybe we would waive or modify screening requirements slightly. Uh, so it happens from time to time. Most of those issues happen with the, the planning board or the zoning board through those process uh, permit uh, reviews. But occasionally we put that in there at the time just to have that ability to uh, address the parking within the current you know, specific situation that we might not have been um, anticipating. Uh, as far as, you know, for, you know, enforcement of it, you know, if John gets a call and a violation of the parking uh, on the site, the first thing we do is go to the plan. We look at what was approved and what's expected out there. And, uh, you know, then the inspection occurs and, you know, compare the two. Sometimes we find that the parking plan just doesn't work. You know, we have to work with a property owner to improve that. Uh, not necessarily a violation that, you know, there's any enforcement action taken, but uh, you know, general, general put efforts into uh, making, making that parking better. Uh, so yeah, that, you know, that's probably the day to day. Thank you, Rob. Pam. Um, call on somebody else. I forgot what I was going to say. Now, no other hands are up. So um, we're going to move on to this living off campus certification. Uh, something that I heard in comments as we were discussing general um, things about the bylaw as we rewrote. So I tried to put this in here. Um, I found UMass has some sort of living off campus certification. I want to remind people student rentals are defined as any dwelling unit, not property. Um, and so I don't know how well this can be enforced, but a student rental in this bylaw is a dwelling unit containing one or more persons unrelated attending 
an undergraduate um, college, basically. Um, we should probably consider having an undergraduate graduate or graduate. And so, so those two go hand in hand with this. And again, um, proof that occupants have completed this certification when you're issuing a permit before occupants it I'm I'm I'd like to know whether we think this is even um manageable from an application point of view given the definition of dwelling unit it means in Puffton they'd have to know who's a student and who's not um versus student home I know in state college they define it homes and it's only single families um single family homes that apply to that definition and things like that so Jennifer then John then Pam so I think I might have initially suggested this. So I was thinking it would, what I was thinking that it somewhere could say that we would suggest that to the landlords or the landlords would encourage. I, I even feel like it's a little strong to say proof. So I was, that's where I'm coming from. Okay. John? I'm just uh, thinking, you know, that it's a five college community. We have, we have students from other schools that are here um i don't know if would they be going over to umass to get this certification so i believe it's an online thing and open to anyone but okay. i i can't guarantee so again this is why i asked my question pam um my understanding just from a couple of years past with sally lenowski is that they it's sort of an educational program they they make sure that the, the students are aware of their responsibilities as well as um, their rights. So I also did have the question that was like, how do we prove that they have it before you give a permit to it for a unit? Um, I, I think, I wonder if we could move this a different direction. And that is just to say, UMass needs to require, um, needs to notify or require a certificate from all of its students, we we need to know, you know, how many are off campus and how many are living in Amherst. Oh, I think it's quite the answer. Go, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was two different. I, I think that, you know, having a, a record of, you know, knowing that, what's yeah, out different. there is different than, yeah, having proof that they've actually taken this online. I think they, again, they should be encouraged. I don't know that we need to get, that's a little heavy handed to have to have proof that each student has taken this online, you know, little, little uh, you know, work plan. Pat? Um, when John was speaking, my computer froze. Um, can you say to me uh, then, or the question was, what about um, Hampshire College and uh, Amherst College? And I didn't hear the response to that. So if I can get that clarified, it would be helpful. Um, John, do you want to give your comments again? Yeah, it was just exactly that. I'm, I mean, we are going to require people to take a course and get certified by UMass, but some of these tenants aren't UMass students. They may be students at other places. And so the, the thing I said was, I think this is a certification that is open to anyone. I'm not sure it's behind sort of a student firewall or anything, but I'm not positive about that. Um, so what I'm hearing from the committee is moving this out and sort of deleting it from this section, but maybe adding it into regulations about an application or some other finding another way to encourage students to take this if it's available to them, um, but not making it a requirement. It, it may be discriminatory to those that are not UMass students, but fall under the definition of student rental. It may be too hard to actually enforce, um, just all sorts of reasons why it might not be wise to put it in here as a requirement, but let's find a way to figure out how to encourage students to take this course and even non-students right um I, I haven't taken it myself um but it could be helpful to anyone for all i know um shalini 
Yeah, I think if we change the name to something more like tenant empowering tenants and or something like uh, because there are two parts to it. One is tenants' rights, and uh, and then also responsibilities. You know, so it's like the rights. Like many tenants, we heard didn't didn't know what their rights were, even though the state provides and this new bylaw is going to provide a lot of rights. So I think it'll be an incentive for them to maybe participate in it. And and at the same time, it is like, what are your uh, responsibilities being part of a community? So maybe changing that name, and that's probably you giving them that feedback that they could change the name but i think it's a very uh good idea for everyone like you said mandy joe not just students but all tenants to take that yep so at this time we're going to move on but we're going to move on to i'm going to stop the share for now um once i figure out how to do that um, and we're going to move on to general public comment um, or public comment on what we've been discussing um, and see if anyone's got any comments on what we've been discussing before we go back to discussing language that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so right now, if you'd like to make a comment for up to three minutes, please raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn and Athena will be the one that helps us get you so you can make your comment. So Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself, state your name where you live and make your comment. Hi, this is Renata Shepard. I live in Amherst. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, I was composing an email, so I'm just gonna read from it and I'll send it. Um, could a temporary permit be issued until requirements are met so landlords, especially small landlords, don't lose rental income while completing all bureaucracy? Uh, please remove inspection requirements for every move out. It is impractical and expensive. At move out, uh, places get cleaned and repaired, especially if there's security deposit involved. Uh, even yearly is a netted cost. In a region where people move a lot, uh, we can have yearly tenant changes. Uh, rents will be higher, more, in, um, and there will be more inconvenience to landlords and tenants. Landlords would um, penalize people who just want to rent for a year. Personally, I myself would try to get people who want to stay for several years, and those who just want to stay for a year might, you know, well, not be chosen. Um, if larger properties don't get all units inspected, but they still ch charge a higher rent than me, for example, they are benefiting from not paying for an inspection that I must pay. Um, that's unfair. Um, yeah, thank you. We lose Mandy. Maybe you are muted. I was totally muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot I muted myself. So thank you, Renata, for your comment. I and then we're going to recognize Pearl Ann and Nathan Margalit. Please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Can't unmute myself. We can hear you now, Perlin. Oh, can you hear me? Because nothing yes. came up. So um, we live at 65 Brantwood Drive. We've lived here for a long time, almost 30 years. Um, John knows us pretty well. So does Pat, Pam Rooney and Jennifer. And I've recently had contact with Rob Morris. So there are a couple of issues that I really want to know you can give us some clarification because I really speak on behalf of a lot of people in our neighborhood who really feel that we've been let down and neglected by the town. So just a general question is, Rob, you mentioned there are like 5,000 licenses that are issued. Are these all for rentals? Can you possibly give me a breakdown in terms of which are student houses and pet the Angelis mentioned family houses. So can you give me some kind of ratio there? Thank you for the question, Perlian. I want you to finish your comment. We generally don't answer the comments during public comment. Um, we may be able to get those answers when we go back to full discussion. I appreciate it. Enough to say, um, please okay. make I just comments. have one other comment, and that is um, we speak about a parking plan. Um, 
neighbors have sent photographs in of students, the houses between uh, Kingman and Jason Court who are in violation of their parking plan. They might have uh, four cars that are allowed in their driveway according to their parking plan. They have up to five and six and they can have between four and five parked in the road. Uh, do you have a question about the parking plan requirements and violations associated with yes. that program? Yes, because they're not being enforced. So how I'm I'm curious about why aren't they being enforced? Okay. Any other comments, Perlin? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your this comments. Forum. Um, thank you so much for your comments today, Perlin, and for coming, um, and for Renata for coming. Um, with that, we are going to close public comment for this time, um, and we are going to go back to um, language looking at, and I know, let me share my screen again, um, I know we're not going to get through it all today. Um, so I would like to hear from the committee whether they want to talk about use, display, and consent. Um, the orange parts I just scrolled through or the violations, enforcements, and penalties for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, I tend to go to violations, but yeah. Pam? Yeah, ditto. Because <laughs> that's what people were expecting. Um, so violations, enforcement, and penalties. Violation, we'll, we'll do these by those three sections. Um, violations first. Um, before I talk about that, um, temporary permit was discussed. There is a provision in the first section we talked about today, the issuance or denial of permits that allows for temporary permits to be issued. So I, um, I just wanted to say that. Um, we did talk about move out inspections a little bit. We'll see what the next draft looks like. Um, those are the only ones that I can answer at this point um, that, that I'll do during this discussion. Violations, I tried to make this equivalent to what we have now because um, that's what Rob said he thought he wanted. Um, so Pam, on violations. Sure, and in number one, I mean A, 1A, failure to comply with any requirement of this bylaw, I would like to also add or zoning bylaws. So Rob, have we included enough in this bylaw that any zoning bylaw requirement failure would constitute a failure to require to comply with this bylaw? I think it does. Uh, and we're heading that way um, in, or have in our discussions. And I think we could make sure that that works in A, but I was, I was actually more, more concerned about C. <laughs> so, because if there's, you know, each condition of the bylaw, the way we've been talking about making it kind of capture everything possible, we, we lose that, you know, the multiple violations, we lose that when with, with it written like this connected to the bylaw. So, you know, if more than one has occurred, each shall be considered a separate offense you know, without it specifying of the bylaw. But I, I think the other sections were okay. So Rob, you would do that? I would. Okay. And you believe that we do not need to add this bylaw or zoning bylaw shall constitute because you believe the zoning bylaw is already well enough incorporated into needing to be complied with under this bylaw that not complying with the zoning bylaw would constitute a failure to comply with this bylaw. We've, we've said any bylaw regulation, state or local code, we've included everything that we're aware of. Where do we say that? We were just I looking at in inspections. Yeah, I gotta find it in the inspections somewhere. Um, so I don't actually know it was it was under this um, was it this one? All um, 
The structure complies with the provisions of this bylaw and all other applicable codes or bylaws. So that, well, that's to issue the permit. Um, let's see. I know we, we talked about it somewhere. Oh, inspection standards. Oh, this one, this one. <laughs> I knew we talked about it. Law and regulation compliance. All rental units and rooming units regulated here under shall comply with all applicable local bylaws and regulations, as well as all state laws and health building and fire codes. So I think that's where it is that we've brought in those zoning bylaws into, if you don't comply with this, you don't, you don't get your permit. And so you violated this bylaw because you violated the permit issuance. Would people be more comfortable putting or zoning bylaw in here? Of this or other of other local, local. No, I mean you have to either sort of list them all or not list them. It's which is why I think I tried to put that local laws and regulations up there. That was, I think, my way of attempting to pull it in. I'm I'm okay for now. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments on the violations section? We'll move on to penalties. So monetary penalties are up above. That's the 300. Um, Actually, I do. Sorry, I forgot to put my hand up. Oh, yep. But it's, but it's back up again. Um, in that same, um, in that same A, 1A, I feel like, I feel like we should say something because it's the very first time we're talking about violations. Um, and add the words and may result in suspension of rental permits. So non-monetary penalties is suspension down here. Are you trying to? I'm just trying to make that as a, as a more blanket statement. It, it seems like that's it's just a general statement about violations. And then and then we get into details below. But it but I think it'd be smart to put the warning in there. Right now they nobody's nobody's scared about losing their rental permit. Oh, they're not they're not even getting a rental permit, so they're definitely not scared. Thoughts from others? We just put it in and we can always take it out. Pat? I don't think it should go there. Um, Jennifer or Shalini? I don't think it could hurt. I mean, that's... They're in including suspension of a permit. So I'll say I worry by pulling out one thing and not all the others. And, and I guess that's why I hesitate to just mention suspension. Um, because I worry if you just mention suspension in here, what do, you know, order to remedy, problem property designation, um, you know, person in charge appointment order to vacate, how do they fall within this too? Mm -hmm. And so I just get concerned of mixing the two sections or putting only some as specific mentions in, which is why I hesitate to put it in. Jennifer? No, I'm taking my hand up. Oh, okay. Let's, let's, let's go for now. Yeah. I may come back to it. The, the other the other items are violations that could result also in 
loss of a permit. And so it's, you know. So they're all penalties. Suspension is a penalty for violating something. Notice of violation is a penalty. The, the order to remedy is the actual penalty, not the notice of violation, right? Um, monetary penalties are penalties. Problem property designation is a penalty because it comes with additional requirements, potentially um, appointing a person in charge. They're all penalties um, for violations. So let's talk penalties. Monetary are up above of $300 certain people to enforce. Um, I trust Rob will tell me at some point if I didn't include the right people. Um, I can page up there if people would like to see who are the non-criminal enforcements. We've left criminal in there for now. Um, and then there's the rest, the notice of violation, order to remedy, problem property designation, suspension, revocation, denial, um requirement to appoint a person in charge the order to vacate and then the court relief um we'll start with that suspension and revocation procedures showed up below so thoughts on the penalties have we included all of them um and stuff pam um i would i would like to consider adding something under 9d um between one and two so I'm calling it 1A um, because you're talking Here? about uh, between those two. So inserting okay. inserting a new one. Um, and that was that the rental permit should be suspended whenever two or more zoning offenses, C section, blah, 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 occur within any four year period. That period beginning with the date of first enforcement notice or final determination in favor of the town. Um, that you've got the language somewhere below i believe i saw i right? may yeah i did i it's on it's on the the last page i tucked it in right and you wanted a shall um yeah thoughts on a shall suspend for two zoning violations in four years. And you wanted, and, and you were thinking, is that suspend or deny renewal? The rental, permit, the rental permit shall be suspended or denied. Well, a suspension means that there's a period of time um, remedies can be made, but there's typically a time period associated with it. It's, it's loss of income because they, you know, they have not maintained their unit. So when we issue, here's the effect of suspension, revocation, or denial. Under a suspension, so so this only includes a suspension, but it would be under them, you have to vacate the unit. And so I worry about two zoning violations in four years suspending. I think this is part of what Rob said of why we don't suspend more often. If you if you have to vacate the unit and you suspend in January, where do the residents go? When that zoning violation may not be any fault of the residents um, versus denial. Well, one of the zoning offenses is over occupancy. Because that comes straight out of the that comes straight out of the zoning bylaw, right? And but you'd be kicking all six out, not just the two over occupancy with a suspension. John, another zoning violation is um, you know a car on the lawn. This seems pretty harsh for that. Guess guess what really bothers most of the neighbors? Yeah, I know. The neighbors I hear, are in I hear I hear from them. That is the biggest complaint in terms of disturbing the peace and quiet of someone's, you know, peaceful use of their home and property. So yeah, I I worry though that we begin treating your economic ability to own a home differently if you don't have that economic ability and you're renting. And therefore, you have the potential to lose your home because your landlord doesn't 
put a parking plan in or doesn't do, you know, because zoning violations are a lot, right? It's not necessarily the tenant that's violating it. It might be the landlord through no fault of the tenants. You know, the, the landlord didn't maintain the fire safety system. And so now the tenants have lost their home. And it wasn't even during your tenancy that that happened, right? Um, you've got your, your lease signed for the next year and the prior tenant did something and now you don't have a home. Um, whereas if that happened in, in a place where you owned your home, you wouldn't be kicked out. And so I just worry about the effect of kicking tenants out of homes when it may not even be their fault for X violation or Y violation. I'm not sure I understand why why the future tenant would be affected by the previous tenant. Well, if it's every four years, if I've if I've signed a lease, you know, we heard these leases are signed in January, December, whatever, for the next year that starts July one or June one. And the zoning violation, the second zoning violation happens in May. You've just lost your home two days beforehand. Um, and now you can't occupy because suspension is vacated and secured. Um, right? I, I understand Rob's concern about suspensions. And so I worry about. I worry that. I worry that we have absolutely no teeth then besides besides some some fines that many multiple land landlord landlords would scoff at and not do what we want. Jennifer? I'm just throwing this out. I mean, could it be tied to um to renewal, you know, when it's at the end of the lease? Like they they couldn't would be some suspension when issuing the new lease so that the current tenants aren't penalized, assuming it's obviously not a life safety issue. Pam. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this for now, but I think when we talk about assigning points, there there will be some actions that will result in um, in loss of a permit potentially, and whether it's a zoning um, transgression or, um, you know, health and safety one, I think they, I think they both carry some weight and need to be acknowledged. So maybe we don't need to specifically call out the zoning, the one here. Uh, I think it's used fairly successfully in state college. It comes straight from their regulations, and uh, not regulations, comes straight from their bylaw. Um, so I may come back to it again if it doesn't feel like the rest of it's holding together well enough. Yeah. Pat? Uh, yeah, and you know, I want to bow to Pearl Ann because I know how egregious the parking situation can be in her neighborhood. But I really am, am finding some of this conversation um, demeaning to renters ignoring impact on renters. Um, and we want to have teeth in our bylaws. We want to hurt and we want to scare. Uh, landlords scoff at us. What does that have to do with vacating four people or five people who are living in a, in a building? Um, what, what, why do you think there isn't enough structure about suspension for health and safety. I, I just find some of this appalling. I, I just have to say that. Jennifer? So we're talking, of, we're also talking about health and safety that, I mean, we are talking about health and safety. So I'm just, I guess my question was just, because I'm not saying we need to be suspend, suspending permits here and there, but you know, I was really upset when I read, you know, reading those tenant surveys that there are students paying a lot of money to live in some pretty bad places. And, um, you know, I know like, and I, maybe I'm asking to Robin and John, 
from the research I've done in places like State College or Newark, Delaware, they do suspend permits. And I'm not saying it has to be done in the middle of a lease where you're displacing tenants. That's why I was thinking if we were going to look at something like that, maybe it's when they the landlord wants to, you know, um, issue a new lease. But it's just that, you know, do we we just want to make sure we have the the teeth that people comply for health and safety reasons. I mean, there's, so that's first and foremost, you know, what that, you know, I know somebody, you know, was doing some research with state and yeah. So again, just, I know that in state college, they do, will deny um, a rental permit if a landlord has a lot of violations and they are, they are health and safety. Usually, you know, they're, they're not, you know, I don't know, because you didn't, you know, fix your banister. Um, so just what, and I can, and I, and some of the, the, the financial penalties, I think are chalked up to the cost of doing business. So I think we're just saying what penalty can there be for a property owner? And we're just, as um, John and Rob have said, it's just a, a, the minority, a few that are egregious kind of scoffles, scoff laws, but there are some pretty dismal rental properties out there. And, and some of them are, you know, the same, you know, property owners are responsible for it. So just what can we do to make sure we have some teeth? I think that's what Pam's yeah. question was getting at. We're not looking to um, evict tenants. That's, that's not what anyone has in mind or is intending to do. I I, I want to take my time to comment before I go back to Pam. Um, I appreciate that, Jennifer. Um, but then we have to be really careful about the wording and what, when a suspension is, quote, required versus right. it's the end of a long system getting to there, um, which is part of the concern I've got about, Pam, your requested addition and wording, two violations, and now you've got a suspension. You have to suspend it. Um, I look at C, problem property designation, and of course we've left a lot of this up to the regulations, which we haven't talked about, and, and that's where I believe the point system may come in. Um, working your way to that suspension, um, you know, and maybe we have to add that somewhere in there, but that's where I see us working towards that suspension or mainly the denial of a permit, that getting that problem property designation because of X, Y, or Z, gives that warning along with all of the fines to, hey, you're probably not, and, and that then also potentially gives the warning to any person who may be thinking of signing a lease for that property or for that dwelling unit. Like, hey, you're gonna sign this, but look, they're at nine points or whatever and one more, and they're not getting the permit for you to occupy that unit come June. Um, you know, I think we really need to think closely about what what leads to a suspension or denying of a permit because I don't want to see tenants kicked out of their units without any notice for something that is not an egregious health and safety violation. Um, and and I know we disagree on whether over occupancy is, but I'm not sure parking is egregious enough to kick tenants out. I, that's where I am. I just don't know. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I guess, more hesitant to add mandatory suspension requirements for, for various, for wide ranging violations when you hit a certain number of violations instead of mandating that problem property designation that would then potentially give warning to people. Um, it might take longer to fix them, but that's where I stand at this point. Pam and then Jennifer. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'm I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be offensive, um, but I did I did want and I and I don't think now that I this is good feedback. Having having that statement in this section doesn't doesn't work anyway. Um, and and we cover something like this, we can cover it in any kind of point system that we want to apply. It certainly would be in most cases definitely a a buildup of points. 
Um, and again, we're talking about very few, but um, this is something that the other, um, for instance, for State College, State College wrote their bylaw regula and regulations 40 years ago. Amherst is just getting to this point now where we have the, the off-campus student population has now reached about 18,000 students that can't be accommodated on campus. And we have finally, I think, reached a tipping point where it is starting to just morph <laughs> across town um, and become very uncomfortable. So this is this is way late. This this bylaw itself is you know years years too late. It should have been in place as you know the ball started rolling. That said, I'm gonna let's let's forget about the two the two strikes and you're out. Um, it, it should be a process. It, there there should be some penalties though for zoning violations, perhaps handled however we want to handle them. So thank you. Sorry to, sorry to buy, you know, sidetrack this conversation for so long. It, it's not a sidetrack, Pam. Um, Jennifer, then John. Yeah, and again, just, I, I'm really not saying this to be, I, I'm, I'm saying this in all sincerity. And I know John and Rob spend a lot of time on the street. Thank you. But like, if you just take a walk over to Phillips Street and you can see, what terrible conditions the students are living in it's so i'm just saying there's some there are you know i i i kind of you know i'm not trying to be dramatic but when i read some of this the tenant and they tended to be student tenants when they put their age 18 to 29 on the forms and they were talking about some of the conditions they were living in and again i it's not the majority by any means it's a small and and they tend to be the properties that john spends a lot of time with but there really are some properties is that you know you shudder to think people are living inside them and so that I really would say take you know sometime just walk over to Phillip Street and just get a sense of what they look like and what we're talking about thanks mm -hmm. John yeah I don't want to um be misinterpreted here I think that suspension of permits is probably a good thing my issue previously was that you were calling out zoning violations and there there aren't that many of them i've actually got documentation about you know the complaints and violations that we deal with and how many of them are sanitary and how many of them are building code and how many of them are zoning i don't have that in front of me cuz i'm you know at home but i'd be happy to share that with the group zoning violations aren't that you know, there's just not enough of them. Um, and something like Phillip Street, you're right. It's it's a it's a hole, but those aren't zoning violations. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna remove his permit for that. How about some health and safety stuff? Sure. So it is 625. Um, I haven't heard anything about the other sections in this one, the court relief and all of that. Um, we did not get to, I'm going to make a note here that we haven't reviewed anything past this part or the consent sections, because um, we do have to move on um, to the rest of our agenda today. Um, so I think we've covered a lot. We have a lot more to cover. Appeals are in there as we go through. Um, and then the, the discussion about um, the potential regulations and point system and whether that point system goes into a bylaw or regulations. I also know that we did not figure out a way to put incentives into this. Um, although the incentives kind of show up in that inspections two, five, things like that for no violations and stuff, um, there, there needs to be further discussion about the potential for putting incentives into the bylaw. And then there needs to be discussion about that orange section we didn't get to, which is tenant notification um, and consent issues about how to get in for inspections and stuff. Um, I think retaliation comp language is in there too. Um, so we will try, we will get to that before we move on in our work plan to other sections, um, but it may take two or three meetings to get to that. Um, so. And I'll explain that now before we go on to our next part, which was outreach. But the reason it is because next meeting, 
announcements and next scheduled meeting, we have flood maps and we will be dealing with flood maps because we do have our letter of final determination. So our hearing was, po was um, postponed or, or continued till the next meeting, our September meeting. And so we will be dealing substantively with flood maps and all of that that goes along with it and all of the bylaws with that. It might take the whole meeting. So I don't know whether we'll get to rental registration next meeting or not, depending on how long it takes us to get through all of our flood map referrals and the hearings for next meeting. So I'll put it on the agenda, but it is after flood maps and everything with flood maps is done. Flood maps has a drop dead deadline for passage under federal law and federal regulation. So we, we have to deal with that. Whereas this one, we have our referral by December 31st. If we don't make that date, we're going to be close, right? Um, and so, but flood maps needs dealt with. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for the conversation today. If we have time, and I don't know whether people have time to stay, um, Shalini would like to talk a little bit more about outreach. She missed the last meeting with outreach, so that's why I put it back on this one. Um, she's looking surprised because she didn't know she wanted to talk about it because I, I didn't. But um, she has some questions about outreach that that um, that that we kind of discussed last meeting. But I think hearing her point of view might be good. Um, but if we don't have enough time to stay, we I can update her on where that was last meeting. Um, Pam. Yeah, before before we sign off, I just wanted to offer a word to John and Rob. Um, we were notified of the uh, the First Amendment audit that apparently took place, and just know that you have our support because it's just really egregious. It's just really awful to see. You know, we we know you guys are working really hard. You're very diligent. You're very conscientious, and to have scum, scum like people do that kind of thing is just really awful. Thank you for those comments, Pam. That's really you. important. You, you, you've got our support and all, um, you know, we, we respect what you're doing. You work really hard and yes, <laughs> it's hard to deal with things like that. So thank you for all you do to us. Anyone else with comments? Um, I'd never heard of First Amendment audits until that came through. And I just said, this is nuts. So the audit was traumatic, but the response from all across the United States is absolutely appalling. And, and, it's, and it just is nonstop. Oh, oh, I'm so oh. sorry. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, I'd never heard of it before either. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. How do we know those are like legit people? Like anyone who is seeing this, like any of us, and we tend to be very balanced, fair, we can see how egregious the way the interviewing and all was done. So I just feel like, and I was looking at some of like got 40,000 views and all, but there are ways to plan bots and all of that to increase the number of views and to have comments from people, you know, like, uh, not real people and stuff. So I am, you know, I think the community is with you and I hope you will not, you know, pay any attention to it. And it's hard not to pay attention. It was hard for me not to pay attention to it, but I had to stop. I'm like, this is not worth engaging with. I probably had a hundred phone messages and, you know, I listened to um, four of them and then I got the gist of it. Um, but the same with emails, you know, we, I had a hundred emails. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, town hall, we probably had 600 phone calls to town hall. It was, it was absolutely overwhelming and totally traumatizing. Are you getting support from? We're going to have a meeting and then I'm reaching out to um, the EAPs because I, I'm, um, I'm hurting from this. Yeah. Oh, I'm, so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Huh. Well, well, know that we respect everything that you guys do um, and, and do support you. Thank you.
with that, yeah. are people ready, <laughs> wanting to talk about outreach or should we just conclude our meeting um, and be done at 6.30? I'm seeing nods to potentially concluding. Shalini, Shalini. I mean, maybe you can, but I think because we have, a, we may potentially have a gap uh, because of the flood maps thing, and it might be good to kind of uh, actually use this time to then do something with the data. So I just want, and because I missed, I don't know if we can just spend five minutes maybe just to tell me like, what are we doing with the data? And if there's already a plan, then everyone can go and Maddie, Maddie Joe, you can just tell me, but. Cool. I, I will summarize and we'll try to be out here, out of here in the next five minutes, but Rob and John, thank you. You don't have to yes, sit through this you. part if you don't want to. Thank you so much for all of your help with this and all of your input and for um, getting service. through a very tough time at this point. Thank you. Um, to, Shalini, to summarize where we were last week, we talked about what to do with the data. We did not talk about what, we didn't get to much more of what other outreach we need to do. Um, other than we need another forum, um, public forum, public community input, that, but that would probably not happen before October because it might be good to have a very good working draft that we've discussed so that we can hear comments on the actual draft. Um, so we haven't set that date yet, but, but what the committee itself last week thought was that the reports that were pulled might be good enough. Um, we can certainly have that conversation again, which is, you know, but but the committee was in some sort of agreement that they might be good enough such that the time spent um, compiling any other further summary might not be the best use of any one committee member's time. Um, if I haven't summarized that correctly, committee, please correct me. Um, so, but obviously you were not at that meeting, Shalini. Um, so, so that's another reason this was on here um, when I got your email um, so that we could hear your opinion and, and maybe it will change other people's thoughts. But that's sort of what we ended up with on our end. While also still waiting for the UMass data from the actual forum, we, we obviously do not have their review of the community click thing yet. Um, they're still working on that, but Shalini? Yeah, I so my work has been in qualitative research and like looking at data like this, and it's always surprising to see what surfaces when we look at it. And I'm not saying in this data we will find something, but since it's the first time, um, I I think it's it would be uh, important to do it and since no one else and since I'm really interested in doing it you know just seeing what because we have made that effort so the two pieces to it like what do we looking at it systematically rather than which is what the brain does it will gravitate towards comments that you know that we are familiar with or we it'll all be like all of us will pick certain comments so it does make sense to kind of create you know under inspection so what I was thinking like inspection related comments or quality of our uh or zoning or you know like have some sort of a schema where we have the different comments and then let that and hopefully I mean maybe we're already discussing those things but maybe there'll be something that surfaces that uh we have not yet included in our discussion and then that can inform our bylaw discussion and then secondly I think it's also good to share with the community that this is the data that has been collected and this is what we're doing with it Sounds good. Um, so it will. So you could really go in and find like trends, like the tenants. This is a recurring theme, right? So I was trying to do that by hand, like write a heading, and then anyway, that's where I left off on data. But so that would be really helpful to see, yeah. you know, what we can say is a recurring theme in each of the categories. Right, and then the other thing is like in a longer term basis. Like I reached out, I haven't heard from Tony, but if we could get students, and actually today at Hampshire College, the opening, I was there, and I happened to speak to two kids, young people, not kids, young people, and uh, one of them was interested in doing this data analysis for us, and like even if I could work with the person and they do the detailed work, and like you know we give them a letter saying that oh this student worked. For the town of Amherst, you know, as an internship almost. Yeah, and they get to show it on the resume. They have great experience looking at the different points of view, how decisions are made when they're competing interests or competing points of view, and how to include all of that in. Our, so I think it can be a very good educational 
experience. So I'll keep trying to recruit students for our committee uh, for this project and other projects. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Pam? Pam? Uh, how do we how do we share the feedback that we got? How do we actually um, do we know what form we can ultimately try to share with the public? You know, with oh, just like engage Amher Amherst is a link. Is there a you know engage Amherst survey re you know re response summary or something like that that we can share? So the documents that you guys all saw were in the packet for the last meeting. That's where they're found right now. Um, we don't have a page to collate everything yet. Um, I'll put it back on my follow up to do list. Um, um, but anything compiled under something like this could go on that page. It would also go in a packet of ours. It would probably go in the council packet at some point um, and all, um, and could potentially, would be able to be linked to from the Engage Amherst page. So there's mm -hmm. ways to get it out there once it's done. Um, just like when we do get the final thing from UMass on how the community clicked with the likes, dislikes, that will go certainly in our packet. And then when we get this page up, um, which I'll follow up on um, this week, um, it would go there too. So what I'm hearing is, Shalini, if you were willing to do the work, this committee um, would appreciate something like that. Um, <laughs> the one thing I do have to caution, because Dave Zomat could not attend today's meeting, um, is at this point we can't promise any formal um you know pay, anything employee related or formal internship related right because that that's not something we as a council can ever promise anything without any type of approvals or anything um but if it, students are certainly willing to work with you to do that um without any of those promises you know obviously you're allowed to write any recommendations you want with the work you've done um um, but um, why don't you talk to Dave? Mm -hmm. um, CC me on that email, but talk to Dave about what might be possible from that sort of formalization point, whether mm -hmm. or not it includes pay. Because um, yeah. he might have. I wasn't thinking of any pay. I was no, just but you know, he he might have better ideas as to what what yeah. needs done to potentially. Yeah, Form, formalize or something. Yeah, like that. what is the official language that yeah. we can use to reach out? And it's the same language and letter we send out to all the colleges. And actually, Paul was there when I was having this conversation, and I did confirm. Is it okay? Like we can write a letter and all. I said, yeah, 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 absolutely. But I will reach out to Dave to get that letter, and then I can send it formally, maybe to Hampshire College, Amherst, and 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 at this point, I would say. An an analysis goal would be whenever we have the next community forum. Um, that might be too quick, even though we're looking at two months from now or so, but it still might be too quick. I just don't know. We have not closed this formal survey. Um, so things are still coming in. Um, the committee two weeks ago decided to keep it open at least a little longer through move in and a little beyond move in um, to see now that students are coming back and others are coming in and our town is repopulating if we get another surge of responses before we close out the survey completely. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, anything else before I adjourn the meeting? It's gonna be a full agenda next week, um, which we won't get to everything. Don't freak when you see it. Two weeks. I put it all on. Two weeks, case. not one week. Two weeks, yes, two weeks. But I put it all on in case blood maps yeah. goes much more quickly than I expect. I want us to be able to use it any time we've got. So you'll see it, but anything like that. With that, we're adjourned at 6.39 p.m. Thank you all for the extra time. Hand, hand, hand up, bye. Was that to say bye? Oh. Hand, did you put your hand up? I didn't see your hand up, sorry. I'll withdraw the adjournal. I will, I'll withdraw the adjournment until I hear from Pam. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Sorry, sorry. it has to do with just thinking again about the, the writing process of this bylaw. So, you know, I guess we just can go in there and do some of our own edits again and then share them with you directly. Yes, so so Pam, if you want, I'll try to get this edited sooner and do what I did last time for you, but, um, and then put a final one out, um, or you can take 
what we did today and just send me potential options um, for me to address if if okay. that would be. I, okay. I don't intend on doing anything to what you did to the regulation section at all. Um, we'll get to that when we have something yeah. okay. specifically on the agenda with that, okay? Any other questions? The adjournment is 640, Athena. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, Randy. Thank you, Athena. <laughs> and thanks, Good night, everybody. Welcome back, Athena. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. -bye. Bye.